uh, to both of you. It's really a pleasure to be here and uh, an honor to be part of this and also to respond a little bit to Professor, uh, Professor Khalidi's uh, paper um, since his uh, work has been so influential on those of us who um, care about the Middle East. I'm going to comment on just two, can you hear me okay? I'm going to comment on just two topics that um, Professor Khalidi touched on. Um, these are more comments for further discussion, I think, and I too am going to focus mostly on Egypt. Um, he mentioned in his talk the kind of hyper-focus on new media in the way that uh, people looked at the revolutions. And I think on the U.S. side, we really see that. We could see how absolutely gleeful attention uh, was generated about the apparently shocking use of Facebook by people in the Arab world. Um, and I want to talk about briefly how the idea of a Facebook revolution was a mistake but like many other mistakes, it was politically and culturally significant. And that one of the things I want to suggest is that although maybe the Obama administration didn't want to pay too much attention to Egypt, the American public certainly did. And I think there were a lot of reasons for that, but I want to talk about this issue of new media. Now, almost every specialist that I know of in the Arab world has argued that um, fundamentally you can't see new media as the driving force behind the revolution in Egypt. Um, political and religious organizations were crucial, activists in the labor movement, NGOs, previous um, small democratic organization, uh, organizations calling for democracy, and of course religious organizations um, including the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, as uh, Professor Hadley pointed out, economic forces are one key factor in what was going on in Egypt. Um, Egypt was very influenced and very uh, damaged by the financial crisis that Rack the globe, and there have been a lot of strikes in Egypt in the previous few years, but including in the previous summer um, before the revolution. In the last six months of 2010, for example, the price of food in Egypt rose more than 30%. So there's a lot going on um, when all this stuff begins to happen. Now, it's not that new media didn't matter, they just didn't matter to the degree, or perhaps in the way that many outside observers implied. The famous story that most people know is that of Hafez Said, who was killed by Egyptian police in Alexandria in the summer of 2010. Um, now, Said had posted a video that he took from his cell phone. The video was of Egyptian police who were dividing up the spoils of a drug bust. So they busted a drug dealer and then were taking the stuff to, you know, to sort of sell or use as they pleased. Um, he posted this video, um, and after he did, he's pulled out of an internet cafe and beaten to death by police. His family then posts pictures of his brutally battered body uh, on the web. And soon after that, a Facebook page called We Are All Hanan Said um, is put up and becomes viral. Um, it had more than 100,000 followers within a couple of months. Now, everything about this story actually highlights the technology of work. A cell phone video, the internet cafe, the postings of images, and Facebook, of course, as a social media. And this set of uh, realities did generate a great deal of um, outrage in Egypt, and particularly, at first, those who had internet access, um, and those who were, especially young people, who were uh, disaffected, but not really reached by some of these traditional organizations. Now, I will say that one of the important things to realize is that this information, which is you know, sort of circulating on the web, also circulates elsewhere, like the I am Hadid Said posters, the murals on the wall, the graffiti, things that reach well beyond the internet, speak to and about it. So there's a, a really multiple levels of uh, dissemination here. Um, but also I want to point out how few people in Egypt had access to the internet and how even fewer of them were really involved in Facebook. So um, most people in Egypt who have access to the internet don't have it at home, they have it in internet cafes, um, which affect our at universities. So this affects who um, goes and, and looks online. And in Egypt, um, the Facebook was increasing dramatically. Um, it increased more than 400% between, between 2008 and 2010. But that meant at the time of the overthrow of Mubarak, about 4% of Egyptians had a Facebook account. That was parallel to about, at that point, about 49% of Americans. Um, now that 4% was significant in a highly charged political situation, which is just important to keep in mind, especially when we think about the way that American news media exists, uh, exhibited this kind of rapturous delight over the role of new media. Um, this delight also bundled with, I would argue, a striking amount of technological determinism on the part of the American media. Now, I don't think 
this initial embrace of the Facebook revolution or the Twitter revolution, so-called, in Tunisia, had to do with the dramatic turnaround in attitudes toward the Arabs, at least not at, least at first. Um, the kind of condescension of American public toward Arabs was a starting point. But Americans were already deeply engaged in older arguments about the internet itself. And I want to suggest the significance of these arguments and how Americans perceived what was going on in Egypt. So from the beginning, and I mean uh, from the moment that people started worrying about the internet in the 1980s, the moment it arrived, people start worrying about it, we've been captured by the question of what kind of thing it is, what it does, what kind of people the internet makes us. And amidst the you know, nearly endless commentary you can find on the topic, including on the internet itself, um, I was most uh, amused by a really bluntly titled recent article on MSNBC, which just asked, is Twitter making you stupid? So not to be outdone, The Atlantic just last month posted an article, is Facebook making us lonely? Um, one could talk about how stupid and lonely we already were, but that's another question. <laughs> So there are many components to this debate about the internet, but one central one has always been about democracy. So the digital utopians have long argued that the internet is a democratizing medium, it opens up sources of information, it redirects power into a fluid network that's not hierarchical, it creates engaged and active consumers and producers of material. Another group I'm going to call the digital naysayers doubt that the internet is really so dramatic or transformative. And this was the position that Malcolm Gladwell took in a New Yorker article titled, Small Change, Why the Revolution Will Not Be Tweeted. Now, Gladwell argued in that article um, that it's, of course, relatively easy to get thousands of people or even hundreds of thousands of people to sign up for a Save Darfur Facebook page, but that doesn't demand much, and that the weak ties um, that are formulated in these kinds of networks simply don't have the power to encourage people to do the demanding and sometimes dangerous things that real social change often demands. Now, Gladwell had the misfortune to publish this just about three months before Ben Ali was ousted out of Tunisia. I'm not usually worried about his fate, but in this case, <laughs> um, by the time the Egyptians took to the streets with some carrying signs themselves extolling Facebook, it looks like Gladwell's human's Trump technology argument has been decisively put to bed. So euphorically, observers in the US, also in the Middle East, but particularly in the US, delighted in what people called Cairo's Generation 2.0, arguing that Egyptians had made Facebook into a vibrant and inclusive public square, I'm quoting here. It was, it seemed, an exemplary internet-fueled democracy. Now, as I said, this is a far from complete picture of Egypt but it did show how events in Egypt were being used, at least by some observers. Preoccupied by the internet of democracy, they turned to Egypt's revolutionaries to arbitrate the debate by proxy. Hmm. Now, however, as events have shown, including events in the last two weeks with the Egyptian Supreme Court outlawed 10 of the candidates for president, there are public squares and there are public squares. Facebook is still growing exponentially in Egypt. But the struggle for a new Egypt is happening on the ground and it's just underway. My question is, will Americans, the public, continue to be as interested in Egypt when its path is no longer so visibly online? Now let me turn briefly to a second point, which is about the role of women. Professor Haddady made the crucial point that the Arab revolutions are about dignity, at least in part. And this is actually particularly important for women where everywhere, who were everywhere quite visible in last year's Tahrir protests. But more recently, their role in the public struggle has become something of a charged issue. So in December, at a demonstration against the government, many of you have heard about this, I know, a young woman was attacked. Now she was wearing a veil and conservative Islamic dress, but when she was brutally dragged away by Egyptian police, her bra was exposed. exposed. In a photograph that traveled around the world, I have one that I didn't make copies of, I forgot. But uh, her bra was exposed in a photograph of her blue bra um, that travels around the world. So at that time, when this happened, that she was being uh, beaten, and then there was another woman who tried to come to her rescue, and that woman was really brutally beaten. But this fact is far less widely discussed. So shortly after this happens, and this photograph gets people really, really outraged. I mean, it's just 
a huge deal in Egypt and in, in the diaspora and in the rest of the Arab world, or at least in some places. So shortly after this, a couple weeks after this, there are large protests in Cairo and elsewhere that the demonstrators dubbed as the Friday of Regaining Honor. Now, women from all walks of life participated. It was an important moment, but it was this particular language of honor that subtly affected the conversation, I think. Honor is a very different word than dignity. Um, honor is more patriarchal, more sexualized, particularly when it's used regard to women. In case of the blue bra, it wasn't just the woman's right to protest it had been violated in this, in this conversation. It was her body. This is true, of course. But it was her body as exposed, her blue bra visible as much or more than the violence against her, her, the beating of her was actually the implicit topic. And it was her body and not the body of the other woman who had been really kicked and clubbed that was the um, explicit and, expli and implicit subject of the honor that needed to be regained. So in this sense, the fight for dignity, and Karama happens to be the name of an Arab feminist organization that focuses on violence against women, Karama being the word for dignity. Um, Karama is particularly important for women, as a struggle for dignity has to include addressing the limitations placed on women in public life in Egypt still, and including an analysis of the discourses that frame their participation, and things like honor and the way those languages have an impact. The revolutions in the Arab world, those so far and those that might come, are profound, but the paths from here, as uh, both of our other speakers have suggested, the paths from here are treacherous. For those of us who are Americans and for all of us who are scholars, the problems of media, of language, of bodies can't be separated from the geopolitics of the U.S. Middle East relations or the on-the-ground realities of those fighting for change. Facebook is not enough. Dignity is often gendered and democracy is still very much up for grabs.